Hi, I'm Doug Hayhoe, and I've written a series of short video essays and podcasts on science, faith, and other topics. Most of the videos relate to one of God's two books, Nature or Scripture. The story of this video, How the Telescope Changed the World, begins 400 years ago when Galileo first turned his telescope on the sky. It takes us through some of the discoveries in astronomy since then and concludes and ends with the James Webb Space Telescope, whose images are enthralling us today. We also look at how these discoveries affect us as Christians. Do you remember the first time you looked at the sky through a telescope or a pair of binoculars? Were you stunned by the craters on the moon? Did you see the tiny moons of Jupiter lined up with its equatorial bands? There you see it there. There's Jupiter in the center with its equatorial bands. Two of the moons on the left side and two of the moons on the right side. Or did you look at the Andromeda galaxy in late summer, when the moon wasn't up, to see a faint elliptical cloud about the size of the moon, barely visible against a dark sky? Whatever it was that you first saw through a telescope, you probably never forgot. It changed your view of the universe. So there's the uh, Andromeda galaxy. And uh, you can see how beautiful it is. 200 billion stars. So. You can actually see that with your naked eye if you're out in the country. I did several times, but it looks great through a pair of binoculars or a telescope. I first looked through a telescope in university. One night, our professor took us to the rooftop where there was a large scope. We were awestruck at seeing Saturn's rings for the first time. There's the beautiful rings of Saturn. So you can see them through a small telescope. Although Galileo is known as the first person to look at the sky through the telescope, one person was actually before him, Thomas Harriot. He studied the moon through a telescope in 1609, July 1609, several months before Galileo. Harriot's results were not widely circulated, however. While well, Galileo's 1610 pamphlet, Starry Messenger, was printed and widely circulated and brought the news of his revolutionary discoveries to a wide audience. Until that time, the church followed the Greek Ptolemaic idea that Earth was immovable at the center of the universe. The sun, moon, stars, and planets revolved around it daily. Everything in the heavens was physically perfect. It was the Greek idea. But when Harriet and Galileo saw that the moon had mountains, like Earth, the Platonic idea of perfection in the heavens no longer held up. It was Galileo's observations of the planets, however, that really upended the Earth-centered Ptolemaic theory. If everything revolved around Earth, why did four small moons orbit Jupiter? And if Venus revolved around Earth, not the Sun, why did Venus's size keep changing in the sky? Galileo noticed that Venus appears six times larger when it is a crescent-shaped new Venus than when it is a round full Venus. But the moon, which revolves around Earth, is always the same size. The diameter of a new moon is the same as the diameter of a full moon. You've probably noticed this, that a crescent moon and a full moon are the same size in the sky. But unless you've looked at Venus through a telescope at various times in the year, you wouldn't have known that its size changes dramatically. That's what Galileo saw. So now here I have the moon on the left here. So the far left is the new moon, crescent moon, and then you have the full moon. You notice they're the same diameter, same size. Now here I've added pictures of Venus, the full Venus and the new crescent Venus through a telescope, small telescope, you can see it like this. Notice that crescent Venus is six times larger than full Venus. The conclusion is inescapable. Venus doesn't orbit the Earth, Venus orbits the Sun. And when it is on the other side of the Sun from Earth and we see it in its full phase, it is much farther away and thus appears much smaller in the sky. Six times farther away, six times smaller. Now here I've got a map that shows that, or diagrams. On the left side you have the Earth at the center with the Moon going around it, almost a perfect circular orbit. The Moon's always the same distance from the Earth within a few percent. Now on the right side, you've got the sun at the center, that yellow sun. And you've got two planets, Earth, that's a little blue dot at the top, 
and Venus, that's the orange dot, just under the blue dot, they're going around the sun. Now in this picture, Venus is really close to the Earth because they're on the same side. But if you can picture it, another picture, Venus would be on the far side of the sun and it would be six times farther away. So it would appear six times smaller in the sky. So that shows that Venus really orbits the sun, not the Earth. It's difficult to overemphasize how much the sun-centered Copernican theory, which Galileo supported, changed our view of the universe and our place in it. Earth was no longer the center of the universe. It was merely an average-sized planet orbiting an average-sized star, the sun. In the following centuries, the universe was opened wider and wider as telescopes became more and more powerful. Although Galileo rejected the church's view of the universe, however, he never rejected the authority of the Bible. You can read his 1615 letter to the Grand Duchess Christina of Tuscany to see this. The web link for it is in my written essay on the same website. Galileo's 1609 telescope was built using two lenses that refracted the light from stars so that it converged at a focus. A refractor telescope. In 1668, Isaac Newton, who based his universal law of gravitation on Galileo's discoveries, used a lens and mirror to build a reflecting telescope. It was still small, however, with a mirror diameter of only 1.3 inches, but it was soon improved on. In 1721, John Hadley used a better parabolic mirror to construct a reflector telescope with a mirror diameter of 6 inches. In the 18th and 19th centuries, telescope building took off in many countries. In England, William Herschel used a 7-foot telescope with a 6-inch mirror to discover the planet Uranus. But he eventually built a 40-foot telescope with a 49-inch mirror. His sister Carolyn and son John helped him discover and catalog thousands of nebulae. There's a picture of me uh, with Herschel's seven-foot telescope with a six-inch mirror, which he discovered Uranus, another planet with. It's in the Museum of Science in the city of Oxford in England. As the telescope expanded in size and complexity, so did the universe. The number of planets orbiting the sun had now increased, with Uranus and Neptune added to the original six. Many more comets orbiting the sun were also discovered. Much farther out, the number of stars seen through telescopes was now in the hundreds of millions. Even more significant were the thousands of nebulae that were being studied, as mentioned above. People thought they were clouds of gas. It was only later that they were known as galaxies, island universes of stars. So here's one discovered and seen and drawn using Lord Ross's telescope in the middle 1800s. In the 20th century, telescopes were built on the top of Mount Wilson and Mount Palomar in California with mirrors that measured 100 inches and then 200 inches in diameter. Working with these, Edwin Hubble expanded our understanding of the universe almost beyond imagination. For he discovered during the years 1924 to 1929 that a large percentage of the nebulae that had been carefully cataloged over the previous century were not nebulae in our galaxy at all. They were other far away galaxies with as many stars in them as our galaxy the Milky Way had. Suddenly the universe had expanded from being one galaxy with billions of stars in it to having billions of galaxies in it, each with billions of stars. You can see my essay measuring the universe for more information on this. Now my mother was at McGill University in the 1930s. For a student job, she helped her professor, the astronomer Vibert Douglas, in her research on stellar spectra. She was the first woman astrophysicist in Canada, Vibert Douglas. So my mother was helping her. Now, since my mother was a devout Christian who helped lead the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship Group at McGill, I wondered, how did she adapt to the reality of a universe that had suddenly expanded by a thousand times? My eldest sister, Doris, it turned out, had kept her diary. When we looked at her notes for those years, my mother's notes, there was no indication of conflict. She loved nature, God's creation, and accepted fully what it revealed through science as she was learning about the universe expanding immeasurably. She also loved the Bible and what it taught us about many other truths. 
Now, since 1975, hundreds of telescopes have been put into orbit around the Earth. Gamma ray telescopes, which detect gamma rays given off by supernovae and black holes. X-ray telescopes detect X-rays from gal galactic clusters and supernovae. Ultraviolet telescopes detect ultraviolet light given off by the sun, stars, and galaxies. The Hubble telescope captures ultraviolet, visible, and near-infrared light, while the James Watt Space Telescope specializes in observing near and mid-infrared light. Now, the Hubble's mirror is only 94 inches in diameter, while Mount Parlamar's mirror is 200 inches. But Hubble is above our atmosphere, so it's actually much more powerful. Thousands of spectacular Hubble pictures are available on the ESA and Hubble website. You can go to the Astronomy Picture of the Day website, APOD, Astronomy Picture of the Day, and see many other photos. And you can see my written essay for the website links. Now here's an amazing picture taken from the Hubble telescope. This picture is not of stars. All these tiny things, if you can look at them up close, are galaxies. They've counted about 10,000 galaxies in this picture from the Hubble Space Telescope. The James Webb Space Telescope was an incredible engineering feat. It consists of 18 different hexagonal mirror segments, all directed towards one focus, so that its light gathering power is six times that of Hubble. It was placed in a particular orbital spot, far from Earth and Moon, so that its orbit remains stable. The best way to benefit from the remarkable photos taken by the James Webb Space Telescope and by Hubble is to explore the web galleries maintained by NASA. Here's just one of those amazing photos. These are gases, uh, star-forming gases. Just an incredible, uh, beautiful photo. You can look at thousands of others. What scriptural truths about creation has the telescope enhanced? As I've reviewed hundreds of Hubble photos over the past 34 years, I've often been surprised at the beautiful diverse colors and mysterious shapes of the objects we see in space, like we just saw in the last photo. At the same time, I know that these faraway objects in the universe usually follow the same laws of physics as apply here on Earth. The universe demonstrates a unity. That's why it's called a universe. This only confirms my convictions that God has ordained a wonderful balance of unity and diversity in his running of the universe. Think of the incredible diversity as well as the unity. For those of us Christians, this reflects back on the unity and diversity that exists in the triune Godhead, always existed, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, an eternity of time before the universe ever existed. The Irish poet Gerald Manley Hopkins once wrote, the world is charged with the grandeur of God. After looking at the Hubble and James Watt Space Telescope photos, we can paraphrase this. The universe is charged with the grandeur of God. The scriptures teach that the universe reveals God's greatness, Psalm 8, God's glory, Psalm 19, God's power, Isaiah 40, infinite wisdom, Psalm 147, and God's divine nature, Romans 1. The remarkable telescopic discoveries only enhance these truths. Another truth I see implied by humans enjoying these telescopic photos is that of, quote, the joint personhood of God and mankind. The joint personhood of God and mankind. Let me use a diagram to show you what I mean by this phrase. So there we have a personal God and a powerful God. Powerful, personal God, infinite personal God. Powerful God, infinite God, he creates these immense galaxies. Billions, hundreds of billions of galaxies. Personal God, he creates human persons like ourselves that we can appreciate these galaxies. As someone has once said, the galaxies don't know we're here, but we know the galaxies are here. As persons, I'll say it again, we know that the galaxies are there by using the telescope, but they don't know we're here. We are persons because we're formed in the image of God who is also personal. But persons are meant to be in a relationship with each other, a relationship in which we can share God's thoughts about what he has created, about the galaxies. How unique is that? 
In the appendix to my written essay on this website, you'll find suggestions about buying a reasonably priced telescope. There are also suggestions about an excellent book to purchase and good software to use if you're interested in becoming an amateur astronomer. Thank you.